Hello and welcome to the A Form show. My name is Alan George and thank you very much for tuning in. Each week we sit across from thought leaders and change makers in the architecture and design space of the GCC. We dive deep into their experiences both professionally and personally and share their valuable insight as to what makes them tick. Our goal is to add value to your day and help you navigate your own personal creative journey. Finally, the opinions and the views of the guest speakers are that of their own. They do not necessarily represent the views and the opinions of the show or the host. Welcome to the show everyone. This week we are joined by Carla Conte, founder and creative director of Brand Creative. Carla and her team provide a truly holistic development and execution of brand. This is done through their offering of brand strategy, graphic design and of course interior design. Undoubtedly this has allowed for Brand Creative to capture a truly unique market niche and multiple accolades along the way. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hi Carla, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Awesome. But well, this has been kind of um, you know months in the making so we're very glad that you know we're finally making this happen just to start off quickly uh cuz I know a lot of designers listening in probably have heard of this word and think that they know it but I don't think that they do because it took me a long time to figure it out whatever I know about it and of course that word is brand so obviously brand is something which is close to your heart something which you obviously know a lot about so for the creative designers out there what really is brand and how does one design it it is really one of those controversial words uh out there especially when you're presenting to to clients um and when you're out there with the general public to understand what a brand what actually brand means uh because it's often associated with visual identity logos and even designers who you think would be far more savvy um and have maybe a little bit more knowledge really still think to this day that um that branding really does mean logo and and visual identity but um there's a reason why as an interior designer myself I've named my own company who's predominantly more even on the interior design services uh brand creative because a brand isn't just about graphic design um and a brand really is for us you should really think of it as a living and breathing person or an entity let's say we call it an entity um and it has its own attributes and it has its own personality and really you should be able to describe a brand as a person it's like it lives with you so it can manifest itself as a logo it can manifest itself as a 3d space or as a volume of space um but a brand really does actually stand for things it has pillars it has a foundation of what it believes in it really and and the easiest way that we describe it to our own uh clients is that we're building a person for you and that person needs to live amongst us the rest of us in this world so it is identifiable it will have its own physical attributes just like every person does you'll be able to physically describe somebody or it has long hair brown eyes this and that yes that's part of it but at the center of it is also a soul right and the soul of something it's really hard to describe because it's felt very differently by every person so it's experienced very differently as well um but of course you know corporations and clients are obviously creating brands that are that can with a message that can be controlled right um and so obviously this is what we're trying to do we as a company build these brands um and build these people let's say or entities as as I called it before um that then go off into the commercial world to do a job of some sorts um it's either selling a product being a space or selling services whatever it is um selling food anything right? right um a brand can also be a person uh it was something that when i was in university uh, and working on my thesis I, i remember one of my peers actually choosing as her thesis the notion and we're talking like 2002 okay right <laughs> that's fine that's sorry fine. to age myself <laughs> but like in 2002 really this notion of branding was kind of, it was really a, a new buzzword it was like maybe really something that people had been talking about for a decade um and, but this whole idea that a designer could be a brand was really far fetched because at that time thinking of a designer as a brand was really egotistical 
So along with that thinking that a person could be a brand came a, a, like with it, like all of these notions of ego, True. which after all these years now, we do understand that definitely as a person, you can be a brand. Uh, yeah. And it's not about ego. Yeah. Um, it's about representing your values, your story, you know, in, in a nutshell, yes, there might be aesthetic attributes that are, you know, assigned to you as a, as a, as a designer brand or as a, as a brand. Um, but at the end of the day, um, really that it's that storytelling and that underlying concept, um, of who, who you are and what you stand for that can be branded. Okay? Right. So, yeah. Um, Hopefully I've answered that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, because then I guess my follow-up question would be then as designers, you would think it would be fairly easy for a design director to kind of design the brand of their studio and so on and so forth. In addition to obviously the work that they do in said studio, mm. but a brand of their firm of their company should almost become second nature because I guess they are designers, mm. but why, in your opinion, is that so kind of divorced from each other? Because there are many design firms here which don't particularly have a very cohesive brand, if you may, if, if I may use that word loosely. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that is? So we would probably be defined as one of those people who don't have a cohesive branding aesthetic, actually. We are completely um, diverse and versatile in our style um, and in our aesthetic. So if you open up our website and look at our portfolio, if you are someone who is looking for a very specific aesthetic, um, you'd probably find something that is really up to date and modern, but it would be a one-off. Um, every single project we have worked on since the beginning, so we've been in, in operation since 2011, looks so completely different um, to the next because really at the end of the day, those trends, those aesthetic trends, um, colors and forecasting, all these things really don't matter when you're defining a brand, right? right? So I have to sometimes actually really um, consciously bring in trend and consciously bring in things that are going to at least convey to the market that this is an up-to-date concept, that this is of the times, you know, so... Um, whereas other designers maybe in other design firms have a different uh, philosophy, you know, they work off of mood board imagery and really kind of go off of what really is trendy and what people are very much used to, um, which is great. It makes them really popular. Right. And you can do things like that. I'm actually not even here to dog anybody. Um, you can have that philosophy and actually do super well as, as, a, as an agency, because let's say you're doing residential work or you're doing food and beverage even where being trendy really, really matters right. um, because really the general public is looking for that. So they're looking for a familiarity of contemporary, of modern, you know, that feels right to them, that feels of the times. Right. So there, it's not wrong to be that way. But when you're creating a brand, we're talking about brands um, with most of our clients actually that need to live in this world for five to 10 years. Right. So I'm as much as I'd like to think that I'm a psychic. <laughs> and a lot of people have referred to me as a white witch, but, um, I really can't see into the future. I can't. So I actually, we have to, um, make a lot of this guesswork and it's, and I like to call it educated guesswork upfront. Okay. Right. And really delve into, um, the personality of what we're trying to create. And just like people, brands can change. I myself changed my logo, you know, eight years into business um, because it was the right thing to do. My, our own as a brand, Brand Creative's own personality and inner workings changed. What we felt at that time wasn't the same way we felt when we first opened, right. you know? And, and this is something else that obviously when it comes to retail and food and beverage, like people need to keep up. Um, doing that intelligently is, is the trick. And that's where things get really interesting because, you know, you build up equity in, in your brand and you build right. up, you know, reputation on something. How do you change something when it's super successful? Sometimes we advise people ne not to. There's no one size suits all answer you know, when it comes to rebranding and when it comes to actually doing the right thing. 
um, because we really have to strategically delve into every single case. It's, it's a case by case kind of a thing. So, right. um, yeah, I, I've often referred to brand creative as being a misfit because every project looks so totally different. Um, but you know, if a client really came to me and said, I want my place to feel, look and feel like this, if we went through the strategy process and what they wanted was the right thing, right. we would agree to do it in our own way. Um, but if somebody comes to us and says, basically, I've pulled this whole Pinterest board together and I want you to make this, we're the wrong company. And we often turn people away. Um, and, and that's hard to do as a business owner, by the way. Yep. I don't say that you know with any kind of an ego, like I turn business away. No, I hate to turn business away. I really do. But when somebody's um, you know, objective is to really copy uh, what they've already seen because that familiarity um, is something that they can invest in because they know what they're going to get. Right. It's just wrong for us. We have a lot of risk takers, you know, people who are willing to do something really different. Oh, best clients. Right. Best clients for us. Yeah. We, we were just, um, we, we were just talking about this off air about, um, you know, kind of, um, those risk taking clients being the clients that you really want to invest in and kind of work towards even target to an extent. Yeah. Um, just because the kind of end result is always awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So on, on that note of awesome end results, um, <laughs> I, um, obviously the buyer as a city kind of generically, um, there's a lot of stuff going on with retail design. Um, of course, you know, big elephant in the room, COVID, are we at the end of it? Who knows? But I think retailers undoubtedly were someone who took quite a big hit and have sort of in their way, you know, recovered and everything. But even sort of post COVID, there's always been this debate of, you know, what's next for retail design. Uh, and there are many answers. I kind of don't want to get into all of them and become too generic, but I just kind of want, uh, from your point of view, what do you think is the one thing that we are going to see happen? Well, look, the brick and mortar space isn't going anywhere. It really isn't. So I've been in this industry and specifically in retail as a specialist uh, for almost two decades. It will be two decades in June. In June. So um, I've been hearing the buzz term that retail is dead for two decades. And guess what? It's going nowhere and not anywhere in the world is it dead. Um, it's just evolved. It's changed, right? Um, but even even the ways which in which we thought that it was going to change, people really just assumed that the change was going to mean a smaller footprint. That's not the case, actually. Um, the digital experience really does do very well when coupled with an amazing experience space. So yes, we are purchasing things online, but yes, people are still making most of their decisions, especially on big ticket items like electronics or expensive clothing in person. Um, and the difference is if I pull you into my shop in person, I've got to give you more than just my product. Right. So that entire experience more than ever is so well coordinated by the best retailers. And it's not just about offering something that's, you know, it's, you know, a juice bar or, you know, something, a, a, a playlist that's compiled by a DJ. It really is, um, it comes down to every single touch point and not even that it's even the people who are servicing you, you know, really, again, we talk about brand selecting service staff and, and people who are actually, um, you know, ambassadors for you as a brand that are in like highlighting that whole experience for you. Like sometimes people leave the shop and remember the person who served them more than the shop which breaks my heart as an interior designer. <laughs> Not that, that hopefully that's never happened in one of my spaces, but really, truly when asked afterwards, there's a lot of people who will actually um, talk about the person who served them. And that just means that that particular brand has done such a good job in kind of training their brand ambassadors, you know, to kind of live and breathe, you know, Hollister, Abercrombie and Fitch. They're like the perfect examples of that. You know, everybody's right. beautiful, young, cool. You know, you want to have a normal conversation with them. These are the best experiences because truly the brand has understood the demographic so well. Right. right? So, um, again, all of these things, like what, what does experiential space mean? You know, like how did, what, it, that, that's a big word. And sometimes people don't even really understand, but it is comprised of many different things. 
Um, and of course, there's that, you know, application of uh, the technical side of things and technology, um, which is always, um, I, I, I think, a challenging thing to do well. So integrating technology into, into physical space um, is, is a super challenge. And I think like even over two decades, I don't know how many, how many times I've got it wrong, how many times I've got it right, but, um, you know, a screen is just a foreign thing to the human body, but has now evolved to being something we're so comfortable with in the palm of our hands. It's still hard though, to make it integrate into an overall volume of space where it doesn't feel mechanical. Right. You know, because the best spaces, as you know, still kind of everybody describes, you know, the biophilia and like a warm space and a cafe you can really sit in or a shop that feels very cozy. Well, try to put a screen in behind that and make it feel cozy. It's it's hard. So, you know, again, um, I think like if I were to kind of summarize that uh, going forward after COVID, it's that integration of technology because of how much digital we had to use um, because everything was online shopping. So kind of that um, bridge between that, uh, you know, the digital, you know, the, the right. whole, the, the physical world and the digital. Um, so that, that becomes, you know, one important point. And secondly, the experience on all touch points and, and a good designer, even interior designers, this is what I believe should be really advising their clients on all touch points, right. you know? So, and this is why brand creative exists in the first place. I, I am trained as an interior designer and an interior architect, but at the end of the day, I want to create brands. And if I don't talk about brand strategy and I don't talk about this as a really serious phase, as something that I get paid for. So it's not just one conversation. We actually often, even on our own design process, we, we tell people, we're like, you're not going to see any design for maybe two or three meetings. Because we've got a lot of research to do. We're going to talk a lot about target market. We're going to talk a lot about your competition. Everything is now on a global level. We're not even looking at who's next door to you. You can't create a brand even just for one country anymore. True. You know, True. we are really globalized. Every, every concept has the capability of actually living all over the world. True. So um, our, our whole research phase is super important to us. And we do actually spend a lot of time on it. Right. Okay. I, I think that term that you had, fidgetal, was was quite cool. It's kind of like twisting the wheels upstairs now. Yeah. Um, but I think um, I think I want to maybe then kind of just digress a little bit because I completely agree that putting screens, uh, although like you said, you know, our phones are kind of become an extension of self. I sort of agree that putting screens everywhere is probably not the best thing. But I kind of then want to get your opinion on things like AR, for example. I know that VR is completely virtual and that's maybe not the right way, but kind of this middle ground of augmented reality, especially for something like retail, do you think it actually has legs to go on? Absolutely. Like this is where I actually think that it makes my job a lot more interesting and especially at my age, um, changes things. Um, because of course I didn't start off that way. I only had to think about the built environment. And the minute you add in AR, you're just, I mean, the options of actually changing the mood of a space um, and that experience for that user, it just opens up in a way that I could never have imagined when I first started out in this career. So not only do I think it has legs to stand on, but I, obviously it is the future and it's just going to get better and better, of course, as things become more affordable. Uh, for bigger brands as well, you know, our conversations with pharmacies um, and bigger brands that really have a rollout, like 100 locations plus, they can really properly invest in the technology of AR in a way that makes it feasible to actually be done. Right. Um, at the moment, why you're not seeing it so much, you know, you might see it at uh, a design fair. Right. You know, you're going to see it somewhere really special or at the airport in the duty free because they can really afford it. Uh, we're still in a space sadly, where it's just not so affordable that you're seeing it in the everyday or in smaller boutiques right. um, where the everyday person can experience it. Um, but also I do feel that um, designers need to figure out 
um, and really spend time in that space of understanding the capabilities of AR to make it work well. Because often, sometimes I'll see it like in a duty-free environment, let's say, and it feels like it's just exactly the sample program that was probably sold to them. Right. And it, it doesn't really push it all the way. It's kind of just like a gimmick. It's not exactly. really doing much. And the gimmick is, and this is my thing about screens and technology and the, the gimmick aspect of things. Yes. I mean, look in the Middle East, um, oftentimes things will be ex- described as a gimmick, but you know, we live in such a, a an Instagram world here. And, and obviously that being the biggest platform um, of retailers, really, it's the biggest way that people are selling even skincare, fashion, um, accessories, all that. Absolutely. The number one place. Um, but really nobody's really pushing the limits on how to do this well. And why am I not doing it? It's because I, I honestly don't have the type of client who can afford that yet. So to create the type of software in the background right. that goes into that, right. to be able to make it a reality, it's still not really an attainable thing for the people, some of the people that I'm working with, right. some of them. Right. Okay. So, uh, and then the other ones that can afford to do it sometimes don't want to do it. You know, right. it's not in their, it's not what they want. So it's funny. I think all of the parameters and all of the different points around um, a client's brief and a scope of work kind of say whether or not, you know, using AR and integrating that within your space is going to actually work out. Right. So it's not always the most ideal situation to suggest even that we use that within right. a concept. Right, right, right. Oh, very true. Very true. Um, I, um, I do have something that I did want to ask you because um, there's this, um, well, not, not really, uh, I mean, more of a concept, mm-hmm. more of a very high level concept, if you may, which a lot of designers have kind of bought on uh, and spoken about on the show. And I kind of want to get your opinion on it. Um, which is, is it possible? Um, obviously, you know, there are, you know, retailers here that have multiple brands under their umbrella. They have, you know, a line of clothing, um, high end clothing, low end clothing, whatever it may be. Mm. Um, this kind of notion of you could technically with AR have a thousand square foot white box, uh, kind of give customers glasses and kind of have all brands present in that same space, Mm. which no one without these glasses can see. But if you want to shop for something specific, you kind of put on these glasses, you see your shop that you want to be shopping in. You can interact with uh, the products that you have. Mm. And then at the back end of this space, you kind of have Amazon type fulfillment center, wherein you pay for your product, product gets delivered to you. And you kind of walk out. Mm. Now, obviously, this doesn't apply to big ticket items like like you said, but mm. kind of like your low to mid end level brands. Can this be something which is even feasible in your opinion? Is this workable? I, I if somebody came to me and asked for that, like a white box, well, first of all, they wouldn't need me. <laughs> they really wouldn't need me at all. Um, and then, you know, like, because you basically need a white box and glasses. That's uh but uh, I think it negates everything else I do when it comes to the development of a brand, because the brand, like the actual brand space, will also include um, all the other haptics, the multi-sensory experiences um, that are so. I have no idea how powerful. I, I, I studied hapticity for my thesis back in university. Um, and actually studied how blind people experience spaces. So when you take away sight, right, um, how much more elevated sound and smell and touch really are, right? So we, in our own concepts, really try to make sure that that, all those other senses are kind of ticked off and and kind of put into our concept. Uh, Whether or not that's working with a fragrance company to come up with a unique scent for the shop, um, or actually bringing in food, you know, uh, into a retail space, which is totally the, most people are kind of doing that, especially in the health and uh, beauty world, you know, like definitely you'll find juice bars and things like that. Um, and actually working with really tactile and textural materials. Um, I think if you were to probably hook up the human body to machines that could actually detect emotion, cortisol, happiness, all these serotonin, all these other things, 
um, my, my guess would be that somebody who's in a real space is just going to leave that space with all these things integrated with such a far more like profound experience of that brand than if I went in, put the glasses on and left. Right. So look, let's look at it from two different things from the emotional side, because there's emotional Carla, right? Who's really <laughs> em- empathetic. I like to think of myself that way. Hopefully I am, um, who loves to, um, really work with the emotional side of space. Um, and actually, you know, uh, making sure that our spaces are evoking some sort of response, right? That's, that's not easy to do. And so yeah. that really means like you have to, you think about things that are nostalgic, you know, you bring in color psychology into things and it's really, really considering it's a human centric philosophy to design. Right. Um, and then there's the commercial Carla who also thinks that on who knows it's not, a th- I don't think this is just proven. When I do tap into those emotions, so don't think of me as a manipulator, sorry for what I'm about to say, but when I do tap into those emotions, it is a quantifiable result that I'm going to pick up more sales because I'll probably have you in my shop for a longer time. You'll probably be more susceptible to somebody speaking to you. And I know that when I'm able to get the shopkeepers or whoever is there to speak to you, you're also going to increase your basket size. Um, and those are all tactics, you know, again, please don't look at me as a manipulator, <laughs> but I am paid to do this. Right. right. So there is when we talk about the science of branding and retail design and, um, you know, the tips and tricks um, that go in behind this, we have a commerciality to our work as retail designers that has to be part of the equation of our work. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I think I'm never going to say yes to the white box glasses solution. But like you said before, I think it'd be super cool to have the space, the traditional space as I want, or the experiential space as I want, and to somehow integrate AR and have that digital experience where I have my device in my hand because it's so comforting to me. Right. It's like a baby blanket, you know, and being able to experience a space with it, it actually is a connection. Right. It's actually now, which is not a connection that existed 20 years ago, but it's a very real connection today. Right. Holding onto my phone is like holding onto my baby blanket if I right. was two years old. So... Um, yeah, I'm all into that. I'm really into that integration of the, of the two worlds coming together, but not solely white box AR. No. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> all right. It's, it's, it's curious to me that because obviously you do so much research into brand, mm. right? From your findings, and I know this might be confidential and, you know, it's trade secret, fair enough. But what are some of these sort of interesting finds that you're seeing with brands here specifically with regard to design, what are they kind of, well, not just wanting, but what do you think they will want in the future? So I think like when we look at the research that has been done by um, heat mapping and things like that, um, and in terms of like what gets used the most, and it's very, again, it is really specific maybe to this region. You know, obviously uh, we study like the different demographics and when a brand that has originated here actually goes outwards. It's, di- it's really interesting to see how differently a space could be used in Europe or right. North America. Right. Um, but I think that um, psychologically people are really gravitating towards spaces that can be lived in for a while. So retail space is not is like, I think that's a fundamental difference between North America, Europe, and the Middle East. People spend time, people linger. So the time spent somewhere um, really counts in the way that we do design. So people really do spend time in a fitting room, which means you have to provide a seating area. You know, that means family members are waiting longer and you want them to sit around. Um, Or it means that you want to incorporate a food and beverage area, right? That really gets the... There is no get people in, get people out. That's a hypermarket philosophy. And even if you look at Carrefour today... And the way that Carrefour has been designed in the Middle East, it's like a completely different place. Right. They want you to stay. And right. that is so completely foreign yep. to what a hypermarket was designed like 20 years ago. When I first started, I actually worked on a lot of hypermarkets in Latin America. And it was like, get them in, get them out. You know, that kind of a philosophy. So um, 
I think that um, retail is, again, this whole experiential, the idea of being an experiential space um, and getting people to feel like it's a second home, a place to be a second home. So that, I mean, we don't just design retail spaces. We also work on food and beverage concepts and wellness concepts. Um, And in all those realms, that lingering, that kind of time spent away from home um, is really important because if I go to the yoga studio, it's not an in and out experience. The yoga studio has a retail component. It has a cafe. It's an, um, there's an amazing, you know, uh, change area upstairs where they invite you to kind of do shower, hammam, whatever it is, asana, steam. You could literally spend hours there. So, um, I would say that for sure, that's something that I see as a trend, like really building these multi-purpose spaces here, a restaurant or like a, or a cafe, a cafe is not a cafe here, especially like if you look at all the coolest concepts in Alcuz, Al Al-Sarkal, courtyard, these are places you could work in for hours, you know? And of course, that's another thing that you can't negate now, especially post COVID, um, is the fact that if I don't want to work at home all day long, if I'm one of those per- people who have moved into the work from home situation, that cafe becomes, you know, a place for me to have some refuge, you know, away from, from, from home um, and to kind of clear my head or just to feel like I'm in a different environment. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I am really glad that I'm here and witnessing this kind of multi-purpose. It makes my job so much more interesting as a designer because the retail shop is not just a retail shop anymore. It really isn't. It's all right. these things, but everything is all those things. Even restaurants incorporate a retail aspect to them now. The best ones do because they'll have branded merchandise um, that people are proud to wear. You know, I, I grew up in the eighties. And so like planet Hollywood as a brand, you know, had a great retail experience or hard rock cafe. These were like places, restaurants that had amazing retail experiences because people wanted to make sure that the world knew that they were associated to that brand somehow. Right. Um, and here in this space, what's a lot better uh, than what I just mentioned as an example is that these boutique brands and these smaller kind of homegrown concepts that really have heart and soul have created products and merchandise that I would proudly wear, you know, that I proudly want to take home with me after I've had maybe a meal and worked at their, you know, in the restaurant for a couple of hours or cafe for a couple of hours. Um, I think people are doing a really good job of actually creating lifestyle. That's what we're really talking about. At the end. If I, if I like, you know, summarize this, we're talking about lifestyle. So these are all lifestyle spaces and that's, I think that's the business that I'm in. Right. Very interesting. I think, I think for me as a, as a designer, I think I've always ever been so siloed to a brief. I've never really thought about it so holistically. This is kind of like mind opening. <laughs> um, I'll probably highlighting my own ignorance. I don't know. <laughs> but um, very interesting. Um, I kind of then, you know, as, as we sort of wind down the episode, I kind of want to look at more of the, more of the macro um, kind of holistically as you so very well do. Um, and, and this, this question can be across obviously your designs, but even, you know, professionally as a, as a business operator, as a designer, as a retailer, any sector, uh, what would be in your opinion, as you now close to two decades in this field, uh, what would be your biggest key learning? So, I mean, after two decades of working in the retail space, um, one thing I know for sure is that no two clients are the same. I haven't ever been able to cut and paste a strategy for one to the other. Um, and I really also um, think that understanding your customer base and understanding the demographic, as much as we all talk about, you know, the buzzword, the storytelling and the narrative and all of these things, um, the, obviously that it, it culminates, our understanding of the customer culminates and kind of results in a story. But at the heart of every co- uh, concept really has to be a deep understanding of humanity. You know, no matter how commercial you might think I am as, a, as somebody who lives in the retail world and, you know, beauty, wellness and all those things, it's all about getting money. But um, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like a sellout, let's say, 
to my craft because I really have to be commercial in my approach because I really do study the human mind a lot. Um, it was actually a minor in psychology from university. Uh, and I'm really glad that I did that because it gives me a different perspective um, on how and why, you know, people respond to spaces the way that they do. Right. So, and that makes my, it, it really makes my job much more uh, interesting. I think the biggest learning is, um, or advice I could even give maybe is for people to really always step back and think about the people using the space. Um, and we're going to get way more deep on those types of things because if you're designing a cafe um, where after post COVID somebody is really maybe using it as you know their second home, what does second? What should second home feel like? You know, tapping into those emotions, making sure people are really comfortable. That means you have to be a true empath. Right. And I really believe that um, also as my own personal learning, let's say, because you asked about both, uh, whether it be you know career wise to designers or my own biggest learning. Um, the people that I like to work with, whether it be a client or the staff that I hire are empaths. They have to be, I, I can sense it, you know, obviously really quickly in a meeting uh, or in an interview. And I know that when I'm having uh, an interview with, let's say the next design person, and they're really speaking on that level of connecting with somebody on a human, you know, and a very emotional level that they're going to understand branding. Because it means that when they're sitting down at that table or at their computer to actually start designing something, that they're going to approach it with that, how do I feel on this journey? If I'm doing a space plan, I'm starting at the entry here. What am I supposed to feel here? If I walk five meters to the right and I look around, what do I feel now? You know, really mapping out the journey. Again, another buzzword in 20 years that I've heard of customer journey. I don't think people are actually know what they're talking about (laughs) because what they, I think they think they're talking about is more space planning. Like how do I get the customer from the entry to the cash desk fitting room and all that. But customer journey is really supposed to be about the experience emotionally as you go through the space, how I'm experiencing something and actually manipulating in the fun part on the design side, is manipulating a space to really like take out an emotion from you. So if I really want you to feel cozy and comfortable, maybe I decrease the ceiling volume um, and I change the lighting and I work with the certain colors, right? To get you to feel something really specific. If I want to wow you, you know, I, I, I get rid of the ceiling altogether and work with volume of space. That's very impressive. Um, and I, you know, I work with a lighting specialist that'll help me convey maybe daylight or sunlight or something, you know, it's, there's, that mapping out of emotion is how I like to speak to the staff and how they speak to me now when they're describing their work. Um, and I just, I hope that, you know, going into the future that, you know, universities, professors kind of take a page out of this book um, right. because it'll make everything, we are the ones creating everybody's experiences. There's not an egotistical uh, statement. We are, we're crafting everybody's general experience. And I don't have to be the fancy star architect because how many people are actually experiencing that seven star, five star hotel? Not, not everybody, but you know what? Most people are experiencing my pharmacy in a shopping mall or my supermarket in a shopping mall. So I actually feel this profound responsibility to make sure that I'm creating nice spaces, people, spaces for people to really feel like the quality of their life is improved. Right. Almost feel like I should, you know, kind of raise a flag. I'm like, yes, this is what we're doing. <laughs> so it's like, is... you want a hug? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, the, the, that is so true. I never really thought of it that way, but that is so true. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are empaths. Yeah. It's very, very true. If you're doing a good job, you're an empath. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I believe it. The people whose work that I admire, I admire so many. There's a lot of people here who are really good designers, by the way. Um, Because a lot of people like to dog us and and say this and that about the designers in the Middle East. But actually, there's some really talented people here. Yeah. So as 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 a final question, uh, you can sort of take your time to answer this. Um, It's kind of to just see where your, you know, kind of mental space is at. What what are you curious about at the moment? It's kind of just that. 
So uh, the question is, of course, uh, on the show, it's known to be the utopian question. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, it's a risk-taking client, as we described earlier, comes to you and says, Carla, this is the space that I have. It's, uh, you know, retail 2000 square foot type program. Um, and it's, it's whatever you need it to be. And it's pretty much a blank check. It's, you know, infinite timeline, whatever it may be. The only sort of criteria being that it needs to give back to society at large, to people at large, and in some way or the other, be it physically, be it emotionally, be it, you know, in any possible way, but it has to give back something. Mm. So what, what project is that? What do you think it would be? What would you do if you were given that? What's well, exactly what we were talking about before. It's this life, this idea of lifestyle. So I think a lot of retail retailers have the capability of doing this, you know, dream utopian project because yes, you have the, the, the major point of actually bringing people in to buy something, yeah. but at the same time, offering them things, um, you know, like food beverages and all that uh, is one thing, but, um, you know, also complementing that with services that might be a little bit more personal. Um, like for example, uh, we're working on a pharmacy chain right now. Okay. Maybe not the most glamorous thing, but actually this major pharmacy is actually investing in the spiritual realm, um, and working with us with crystals, um, and, uh, color therapy and color light therapy. So, I mean, at the end of the day, this will be a non-chargeable service right. that anybody who is going to the mall and going into their pharmacy will be able to experience. Of course, appointments will be necessary because, right. you know, practitioners won't be always there, but, um, and being able to offer free yoga sessions, um, again, kind of the bigger brands who are able to give back whenever we're working with them, we always say to them, okay, this is the right thing for you to do. Not everything is monetized. Not everything right. is commercial. Um, but when we're able to take care of spirit, um, and we're working with the right people who won't look at me and roll their eyes. <laughs> right, right. We will always be that company who would actually kind of push uh, for this to happen. Because one thing I will notice is for sure, um, you know, Generation Z, uh, this is a this is a requirement. Most of them are reading the books, you know, so much earlier than we ever did. Um, they're so much more awakened and so much more in tune with how they're feeling, I guess, because they're, they're our children. Right? right. So like they're different, you know, that, that, that narrative passed down from generation is just getting cooler and cooler. Right? Right, right. So, um, I think for me, for sure, like the dream job is really anyone that, um, help like w will allow me to infuse these wellness concepts and spiritual concepts and not charge for them. Um, that's a give back for me for sure. Um, of course, I could say things like, you know, a fully sustainable concept that uses, uh, of course, of course. Those are sort of a given. Yeah. yeah. It's almost a given now. Yeah. yeah. Like you must, you know, and, and, and that's the right thing for sure. Um, but I, I think that, uh, again, we can have a profound, um, you know, we can make a profound difference in someone's life as a retail brand. And as that thing that you experience on a daily basis, if we're incorporating this, into our spaces, but it also makes the message of utilizing these techniques and methods. Okay. Right. Because a lot of people will look at it as taboo or, you know, look at it as being something that's, you know, airy fairy, not really gimmicky, gimmicky, but actually, I mean, the amount of research on this, um, that shows how much you can change someone's life. Not everybody has access to that. Not everybody has access to a fancy therapist for two hours right. that can charge 1200 dirhams, you know, and give you not everybody. So I feel like, um, if we're taking care of people's minds and that mental health space, it is really important to us as a studio. We do actually talk about mental health a lot, even amongst each other. Um, you know, again, talking even about like how people are experiencing our spaces. So we do talk about mental health. Um, and the impacts, of course, on co like from COVID, uh, it's traumatic for some people. Actually, some people lost their jobs, lost their marriages, 
you know, if you're not one of those people, you don't feel that, but we have to actually consider that there are, there's a percentage of the population walking around right now, traumatized by what's happened. A lot of people lost family. You know, if you're an Italian uh, from at the beginning yeah. when it was new and we didn't understand what was going on, yeah. you're definitely most likely to have had an, an, an older person in your family that would have died. So right. although you have a lot of people who experience death and these kind of things very shockingly. Right. So again, I really think that um, paying attention to mental health and offering these techniques for free, we could do better. We yeah. should be doing it. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, Carla, without, without doubt, I feel like at least for me, this has been one of the more uh, kind of mind opening episodes that I've had. <laughs> <laughs> wherein, wherein I know that a lot of people, you know, kind of push the narrative of, Oh, buzzword push, push the message of, you know, all oh, we think holistically and so on. But I think, uh, having spoken to so many designers in the city, I think you and your team are definitely one firm that genuinely do it, that genuinely think about apart from design, you know, what are these other sort of aspects that we need to look into and not just research, but actually understand and then kind of feed back into what we do as designers. Um, I think you guys are doing a brilliant job. Um, I think anyone who's sort of seen your work, obviously, who even steps into your office can very clearly see that there's a lot of thought being given to, you know, this kind of holistic approach. Um, and yeah, I think it's very cool. And on behalf of the show, obviously we want to thank you for giving us your time. Uh, it, you know, shows like this are only possible because of people like yourself giving us your time and then kind of us, I guess, spreading it out to everyone. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much thank you for your time and uh, we definitely look forward to having you on again thanks so much I really enjoyed it and uh, good questions really good questions oh so thank you <laughs> give yourself a pat on the back we don't normally get that pat on the back I will <laughs> take that happily it. I'll I'm take that it. happily <laughs> <laughs> awesome and for the rest of you guys we will catch you guys next week fellow A-formers thank you guys for listening Thank you guys for being part of our journey and thank you for the immense support we've been receiving for our episodes. It has and continues to be a very bumpy road, but we wouldn't want it any other way. If you enjoyed this episode and it brought you value, please share this episode with anyone who may benefit from it. But of course, if you loved the episode, follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn, send us a little DM and we may just send you a secret link to a secret episode which we've been working on. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. See you next time. Keep sketching.